Hey, welcome to Conversations with People Who Hate Me, the show that takes people in conflict and connects them in conversation. I am your host, Dylan Marin. Today, we have two endings in one. It is the final act of the three-part miniseries on conversion therapy, and this is also the season finale. Don't worry, I'll say a more official and loving see you later in the postscript of this episode, so let's just focus on our first ending right now, the culmination of a three-week trilogy. In part one, you heard me talk to Garrett Conley, the celebrated writer who wrote the memoir Boy Erased, about escaping a conversion therapy clinic called Love in Action. In part two, you heard my chat with John Smid, the man who ran Love in Action. As you heard, he also had his own journey out of running a conversion therapy clinic. And now, in our grand finale, Garrett and John will speak with each other. Since you already heard the previous two episodes, and I just want to say I really strongly recommend that you listen to them before listening to this, I don't think this will make sense, I'm going to keep this introduction brief. Here are Garrett and John. Let me start recording. John, can you hear Garrett? Yes, hi Garrett. Hi John. Okay, this is happening. Um, So... Garrett and John, hi. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Listen, I love it. So one thing I just wanted to get straight is you both have different memories of when you've last interacted. John has a memory of Eureka Springs. We did have that. Yeah, that was before the film premiere. John, what was it? It was a book reading? Yes, Larry and I were in Eureka Springs and discovered that Garrett and his mom were also in Eureka Springs. And so it ended up where we contacted each other and had a little breakfast together. And then I I was invited by Garrett to go to his uh, book reading. Yeah. Also, incidentally, John, you were there for a gay car show. I was there for a gay car show. Wait. Our, gay, our, gay, our gay car club had a okay. regional meeting there. We're redirecting the podcast. We're only speaking yeah, about this, this gay car show. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, tell me everything about what a gay car show is. Well, the gay, it, there's a gay car club. It's it's national. It's called Lambda Car Club International. Incredible. And uh, I joined that club when I lived in Memphis it was actually one of my first reconnections with the gay community. So cars have been uh, significant in my life, and they've kind of been mileposts for major events all through my lifetime, have hung on car memories. Um, when I was a kid, my aunt and uncle always had new Cadillacs, and my aunt and uncle are kind of my heart home. They're the people that showed me unconditional love. And so I connected emotionally mm-hmm. to their cars. And since then, I've always loved Cadillacs and then convertibles. Convertibles are are the, you know, they're really it for me. I love convertibles and I have two convertibles. I get it. Wow. I mean, I just wish that I'd written this into my book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is, we, we should have more car experience. I, yeah. Boy like feeling the leather. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this, just to be clear, other than the Eureka Springs meetup and then other than some Facebook messages that were exchanged. Yeah. And then we met at the movie premiere, but it was yeah. so hectic and weird. Just jumping in here to say that the movie premiere that they're talking about is Boy Erased, the film adaptation of Garrett's memoir that documented his time at Love in Action. It was, like, it was just a weird experience. But that was a really significant connection I had with you, uh, Garrett, because I remember you saying something to me that really, it really put me at ease. And um, you said, you know, this this is the story for survivors. Maybe someday there'll be an opportunity for for you to share more of your story, but this isn't the time for it. And I thought, you know, that makes t- that made complete sense to me. And it just really, it really put my heart at ease. It just, I thought, okay, that's cool. I can have that. That's wonderful. That's really good. I'm glad I said that. I'm, I, I <laughs> don't remember anything. <laughs> Everything was a blur at that point. And, it, you know, I can imagine that was overwhelming for you too, John. Yeah. You know, sitting in the theater at the premiere, I had so much anxiety mm. because my my mistakes and my failures were going to be thrown on a big screen for everyone to watch. And these experiences and our stories 
are extremely intimate and passionate for us. And I think from the beginning, I had an underlying belief that more than likely the film was going to be somewhat of a a conglomerate, somewhat of a a mashup of of experiences and of people. And so at some level, I kind of knew that my role in that film was not necessarily going to be an exact or an attempt at an exact portrayal of me. Mm -hmm. So watching it, I had that in my mind. At the same time, the audience doesn't have that collection. They don't, they don't necessarily know that. And many of them having their own passionate reactions, their view of it is that was, in fact, the director, the lead counselor of Love in Action, and that the film attempted to portray that person. And so while I understood, you know, it was a compilation of stories and experiences kind of into one person, the audience reaction to the film, especially at the end, when the audience laughed when my name was put on the screen. I hated that, by the way. I just, oh. Okay, so this final slide that John is bringing up is a kind of where are they now update that, you know, we're all familiar with at the end of movies that are based on true stories. And so I'll describe it to you, but the slide goes like this. So first, there's a line of text that reads, the real Victor Sykes left LIA, Love in Action, in 2008. And by the way, Victor Sykes is the name of the character that was based on John. And then after a few seconds, the next line of text fades in, which reads, he now lives in Texas with his husband. I wasn't talking about it at the time because I was just supportive of the movie. And Joel knows this. Garrett's referring to Joel Edgerton, who directed the movie, he wrote the screenplay, and he also played Victor Sykes, the character that's um, based on John. We love each other. He's still in my life. But I don't like that title card. I don't like the timing of it. I don't like the way that it's done. It's like the one thing I would definitely change if I had more power. Yeah. I just didn't have it. Like they they were moving so quickly and I was just like I didn't even know what the ending was. Yeah. You know, and Yeah. It was just very frustrating. <laughs> I didn't mind that it was there because I thought no, that's the story and and I'm glad it's out there. But it was hard to hear people laugh and and I had to just, you know, Larry and I talked about it, my husband and I when we left and and thankfully, we had this conversation because I said, you know what? But they don't know me. Mm. And so their laughter was at the image that the film produced. Yeah, It wasn't who I am as a person. And so their laughter wasn't really at me. When, when people laughed, which happened in almost every screening, it was like hot water just being poured over me. Because mm. I was just, it, I just hated it. I was like, this is gross. It's like when you're in a Tarantino film and everyone's laughing at the N-word and it's like white people and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing <laughs> yeah, here? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why yeah. is this uh-huh. happening? Why? Um, yeah. And I just, ugh, it just makes my skin crawl. Yeah. It's it's a dangerous narrative too. Like, I don't think that Joel meant for that title card to bring laughter. I think he meant for it to bring some irony to the story, which I still would not want. Yes. But yeah. I think it's a dangerous narrative because it allows straight people to say that we did this to ourselves, mm-hmm. right? It like right. it allows them to go, oh, well, he was just closeted and he was using, it's like the nightclub pulse, right, thing yeah. that everyone's like, oh, well, they secretly hated themselves and this is what right. happened. Oh, interesting. Right. And that gives straight people an out because actually it's it's a narrative that was affecting all of us. And yeah, of course you were an actor in that because you were brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I just hate that whole like, oh, well, that explains it. He was closeted. That's why he was acting that way. Right. I don't like that story. Mm -hmm. And I've actually done a lot to try to dismantle that story since the movie came out. Um, But it's it's been hard because, you know, those things get out of control. And and we have to remember here, and this is something that I've sort of developed a viewpoint on as I've moved forward in my activism, like – John and many of the other counselors were victims of conversion therapy themselves yeah. in different formats. And so all of us are trauma victims trying to reconstruct what we were doing, what roles we played, and what was happening to us, yeah. which is, you know, no small task. <laughs> um, and often when I'm doing a reading or when I'm 
when I've been invited to a screening or something of the film, I'm in there with other survivors of not only conversion therapy, but fundamentalist thinking. And everyone's triggered differently. Yeah. It's, you know, the best we can do is just say, like, this is my experience. And this is the experience of a lot of different people. And hopefully we can end all of this torture. John, do you see yourself as a trauma survivor? Oh, absolutely. And and I think actually I'm I'm still going through my own recovery. Mm. Um I because the layers reveal themselves as you go through it. Mm-hmm. I mean, my recovery started when I recognized that the ex gay movement was full of attack and demeaning of anyone who didn't follow their path. Mm. And so I recognized my, my first reality was they've lied to me because there are people who they deem to be reprobate who are not reprobate. And they're actually people that are kind and loving and faithful and live great lives. And, and so my first reality was, oh, my gosh, they've lied to me. What else have they lied about? Mm-hmm. So then I'm looking at the X game movement overall and evaluating my own participation and looking at the history. And it took several years of going through that. Then I finally got to a place where I realized that it wasn't the ex-gay movement really that was at the root of all this, but it was fundamentalist theology and thinking. That's true. And so I realized there was a religious culture that fed this entire ex-gay system. So then I had to start looking at the religious culture. Mm Mm-hmm. I had to start looking at my involvement there and what I believed and and where where that lies in my life. And, and that's been kind of the most recent thing for me is really grappling with the way that fundamentalist religious culture has has harmed me and so many people. And so it's layers. It's just had to kind of unravel. And so when I really began to kind of come out and process all this, I found a a gay counselor. And I thought, okay, this is where I need to go. It's a gay counselor. And I told him my objective was to help assimilate being gay with my life and things that went on. And he was professional and had a whole counseling uh, practice with groups and those kinds of things. And so I went to one of his weekends, which was a a weekend conference. And uh, they did what they call life reenactments, where they would get a person's life story and they would have other people portray a an aspect of that story in front of the person and it would give them an awareness of looking outside themselves and anyway they did several of those things and one of the issues that came up for me was the religious aspect of my history and so we went to small group and in that small group they were allowing people to express their feelings and they had different ways that they would allow people to do that and and they said, does anybody want to work on this today? It sounded so much like love and action. Does anybody want to, what do you have to work on today? <laughs> and, and so I got up and I said, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with a lot of feelings about this whole religious thing. And so they got up and put this big cushion, This the counselor got up and put this cushion in front of her. And she said, lean into the cushion and tell me what you're feeling. And all so of a awkward. sudden, <laughs> the, per- the permission to feel... And the environment, I just completely blew a gasket. Mm. I mean, I swore and screamed and it was everything coming out of me. And the focus of that attention was on Frank and Anita Worthen, the founders of Love and Action. Mm. I just, I, I, I call them every name in the book. You can imagine the worst names possible. That's mm. what I was screaming. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean, it was just, it was so freeing and so healing and yet a shock to me that I had that much stuff built up underneath me against these people. They lied to me, you know, you, you know, all those things. And, and, uh, and at the end I just stopped and I said, someone could be experiencing that much emotion against me. Mm. And so there am I, I'm really screaming, not only at them, but I can be in their shoes. And, and so that was one of the first benefits of being involved in this thing. So we got back from the conference and the, and they wanted me to continue meeting in small groups. So I went to the small group a couple of times and they wanted us to do timelines. And so we all got on the floor and we drew our little timelines and, and kind of put, you know, things that happened in our lifetime. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm familiar with this, you know? And as I talked about my timeline, the people in the group began to challenge me that they weren't seeing enough feelings from me. 
they weren't seeing a reality of what I might have felt about this place in the timeline. And I'm, I'm feeling, you know, just really frustrated with, with the way that they were, you know, they believe better than me, what my story was and, and those kinds of things. And, and finally I just stood up and I said, look, I have done my timeline for over 20 years. (laughs) This is not new information for me. The feelings I've had about these events have long since been resolved. Who are you to tell me what I should or shouldn't be feeling about my timeline? And I got up from that meeting at the end. I stood up and I said, I just want to let everyone know that I'm not going to be coming back to this group. And the group about went haywire. I mean, everybody, like the counselor was like, ah! This feels very familiar. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you've made a six-month commitment and you're not staying for the commitment. And okay, okay, group, we need to process this. We need, what are your feelings? We, you know, I know that, you know, something just happened here to break the group. And I left that meeting and I thought, oh my gosh, the universe has allowed me a moment to experience being a love in action client. Whoa. The, The universe has allowed me a moment to feel what they feel to go through what many of them have gone through. And I went into a private meeting with the counselor a couple of days later, and he fed back to me that, that my life was in danger and that I was serious, a serious love addict. And that if I didn't stay in the group, I was going to experience harm and, and disaster. And I just looked at him and I said, I don't really care what you're saying, but I'm leaving. Whoa. And I'm not coming back. That's like pretty much the same experience. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, it's kind of shocking yeah. how similar the experience you just described, John, is to Garrett leaving Love and Action. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's like it, it gave me that reference point of saying, I get it more than I ever have. I, I understand. I understand to a point. You know, only this was not based on being gay is bad, mm-hmm. which is even worse. You know, the whole foundation of being gay is bad is far, far deeper and far more potentially harmful um, because of where it hits us in our soul. I mean, I hate that you went through that, but I'm really glad to hear that you understand it because I feel like, ironically, like that might have been a prayer that I said at some point and it was answered. Uh, the prayer was answered. <laughs> that John would find Thanks, me Garrett. Thank you for your prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, prayer works. It totally works. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, a- another thing that I think the therapy does by using real therapeutic tools is it makes you wary of all therapy for the rest of your life mm. because you're, because you encounter things that you encountered in a place mm-hmm. like ex gay therapy. And you're like, well, they use that. So probably this is not good for me. Right. And that's been hard. I mean, I still can't see a therapist. I, f- I find it very difficult. My friends get very frustrated with me because they're like, we're your therapist. Please <laughs> yeah. find a therapist. And <laughs> right, I'm like, right. yeah, easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. But, but then another thing I think it does for someone who is intelligent, which I consider both of us to be, I, I think that, you know, we know a lot about ourselves, John and I, we knew a lot about ourselves going into conversion therapy, being part of it. We had the faculties to know when we felt something, when we knew something. Um, and so to be constantly told what you're feeling or believing or thinking is wrong, it makes it so that the rest of your life, like even if you get a, you know, go through an academic career like I have or write a book or, you know, try to figure, read everything to understand the world, you're still thinking to yourself, I'm probably wrong. And your brain goes in this labyrinth mode where you don't even know when the world is going to be peeled back and a total different reality is going to be revealed to you. Because, I mean, not only did we both, I mean, John, I think, experienced fundamentalism. Did you experience it in your childhood or later? No, it, it was uh, when I turned 30. Yeah, I, I thought it was a little bit I, later. I got into the born again and, and the fundamentalist uh, Christian culture. Yeah. yeah, it was when I turned 30. And um, fundamentalism itself does that, right? Like it, it basically says any questions or doubt that you have, there's no room for that. You must ingest this. And I do consider fundamentalism a certain forms of it to be brainwashing, especially since I worked with the Mattachine Society of DC and and a bunch of pro bono lawyers who were like, 
no, this is brainwashing. <laughs> like when you're told that you can't question anything, uh, it is brainwashing. And, and you know, there are different levels of brainwashing, but it's a kind. And so I think that we both experienced fundamentalist brainwashing and that prepares you uh-huh. to lead a whole life. Like, in, you know, it takes forever to get out of it. I don't know if I'll ever get out of it, but you lead your life thinking I could be wrong. And my reality could be reversed instantly because that's what happened. Yeah. Even once you get out, you're you're thinking, well, everyone could be wrong and I could be totally wrong. And suddenly my life is going to change because when, when I go back to Arkansas, I'm like, who was I? And I'm sure, John, you have this experience all the time where you're like, I can't even connect to that person that I was. John, can you? Only in memory, you know, only in in bits and pieces where I'm thinking, oh my gosh, did I say that? Did I do that? Um, you know, I bought, I bought the whole package hook, line and sinker. When I, when I made the decision to become born again, when I was 30 years old, 1984 the year before I was born. Hmm. Look at that. Yeah. Isn't that something? Uh, I had, I felt like I had no other hope, but to buy the entire deal. Because I trusted that somebody with religious authority, with the Bible in hand, that they knew more than I did, that they had a better foundation than I did, that they were speaking with what I refer to all the time now as the big G God and the little J John. And so big G God was speaking. And so I thought, okay, I'm stupid because that was part of my shame-based raising. And I went into it thinking, I'm stupid. I know nothing. They know everything. So I have to believe them. Because I'm, I'm not capable of my own thought, you know, they have it all. And so I bought the whole package, which led me into ex-gay culture, into conversion therapy, into, you know, I just kept buying it, you know, and, and I would look to these leaders and pastors as though they were bigger and greater and, and had more to offer life than I could ever think. And, and so I just followed them and, and believed them and, and until the, the crash of 2008. The crash of love and action in my mind was the cathartic moment where I was given the opportunity to think for myself for the first time. That was it. I mean, most people that I talk to that that walk away from the the cultish aspects, the cult aspects of fundamentalist Christianity, usually do so based on some form of life trauma, a time where everything blows up and God doesn't have the answer anymore. And you're you're left with nothing on the table but to say whatever. And that's what I did. I said, God surprised me. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know where I'm going. I have nothing any longer to hold on to. So I'm just going to stop it all. The insanity is over. Now, what am I left with? And what I discovered in that is that I do have the ability to think. My thoughts, my opinions, my experiences are valid to me. They're my truth. And I, and I said a long time ago, they may not be your truth or the truth, but they're my truth. Well, luckily, you and I both had the faculties to do that because a lot of people didn't, you know, like they didn't the the way that you felt with those other leaders and the capital G God. I was the little G. I, mean, <laughs> I was like little G. <laughs> and, you know, we felt that as well. Like like people yes. like you had the answer and my family thought so, too. And. I mean, I know just speaking with other survivors, so many that never found a way to think for themselves and still find themselves falling back into it and hmm. and listening to old tapes or reading you know, old ex-gay literature. And you're like, please stop. Think for yourself. But it's easier said than done. Yes. It's hard to build that faculty if you didn't have it. It's a cycle. It's cyclical. And, and I know those people too. And, and I grieve. It breaks my heart because it's like, Oh, you know, just just stop and and realize that you're enough, you know. But it, it's painful, and it again reflects to me the role that I played in their life process. And I also have to step back and say, but I'm not the only influence because I have to keep a balance also in order to keep my own sanity. Well, parents chose to take us there. I mean, you know, like people chose to pay for it. it not that you know that can absolve what anyone's done, but it's like. 
you know, there was a whole system of people around us that were telling us the same thing. I mean, I always call out Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis because yes. they have never really, from what I know, they've never apologized. I would expect them to apologize to me at least because I've called them out so many times. Oh, no, um, they're ne- that's not going to happen. They're never going to, No, right? And and they were farming your brochures out to people like my parents. Yes. And they are culpable for that. They're that is, you know, blood literally, you know, it's blood on their hands that they are not. But they not, still believe they. Yeah, they no. still believe what they did was right. And, and they're not doing the work that John's doing. That is the belief system that we had. We truly believed. I truly believed that there was no way a person could ever be gay and have a full life in Christ. Hmm. I, I just so believed. I never believed that people would go to hell because of it, because I didn't believe in that. I never had that philosophy. But I believed for others and myself, because that drove a lot of this. I truly believed that if I ever even allowed a hint of homosexuality to come back into my life, I would lose everything, including my relationship with God. Mm. So for me, it was desperate. It was desperate. It was desperate personally, and because of what I believed, it was desperate for those that I that I saw coming into our program and their families. And it, that was that was the underpinning of fundamentalist belief. And it was full of fear and manipulation. It was it was uh, it, it is just laced with that. And what I've learned ab- about my life is that it wasn't me, but it was what I believed I had to put on out of my fear. And so I look back at my life and I'm thinking, finally, I realized that all those years, I put on a persona out of fear. And so it wasn't deceptive and it wasn't false. I wasn't lying. I wasn't deceiving. Um, I didn't tell people something I, that I thought was wrong. I, I didn't lie to people. But I told people a story that I had come to believe as truth, and it was rooted in that fear. I think that's what's so hard for people to understand that didn't grow up in in these environments. You know, like I speak a lot in New York in places similar to it, which I love. But um, it's always a nice liberal audience who does all the right things, <laughs> um, and they're they're like, I can't possibly imagine ever doing this to my child or ever saying this to my child and right i know that comes from a good place but i'm also just like i want to slap them a little yeah but you didn't grow <laughs> up in that world yeah so you it's have no a, idea. It, well it's also like do you have no understanding of history like if you just look at the like how many people were supporting the nazi party mm-hmm. back in the day and then like 30 years later we're renouncing that they ever even spoke yeah. about it like this is human nature, yeah, right? Like there's something in us, and I don't like essentialism or anything like that, but our history and our evolution has made it so that strong men have a lot of control over our thinking, right? I mean, <laughs> capital G God yeah. is a very powerful idea. And I think that it's hard sometimes to understand that what John was espousing was true for him. Yes. And it's hard for people to understand that my commitment to conversion therapy was true for me. Yeah. That aside from the pressures that I faced, which were many, losing community, family, God, mm-hmm. those were big. But I also actually believed because I I was acting that part. Right. And I think people that I I have this whole thing about how like We should get rid of this idea of the unfathomable. It's a very dangerous idea, Hmm. right? This idea that I cannot possibly fathom why anyone would ever do this. I can't possibly put myself in the shoes of a murderer. Well, great literature has done that forever, right? Even the Bible did that. (laughs) Even the Bible tried to make us understand Paul and Saul, right? So, like, there's, there's a whole group think that's very popular right now that doesn't want to fathom wrong behavior. And I understand where that's coming from. Politically, um, people feel like their lives are on the line. Why should we spend a bunch of time (laughs) sitting around talking about why people do terrible things? We already know why they do. Yeah. 
Right. But I do think that if we're going to have a real soul searching in this country, we have to listen to people like John and myself who have gotten out of fundamentalist thinking. Right. And and it's it's just incredibly hard to do. It's yeah. it's but the unfathomable it just has to go away. I so agree with that. And I think that's largely what I'm trying to do with this show. Yeah. I, I mean, this is, of course, not an internet comment <laughs> dispute. <laughs> I think it's a, a little deeper than that. We can all agree. But, you know, as, as, as I'm listening to this or in this conversation, the term that is repeated in my head over and over again is this idea of hurt people hurt people, right? And this is like hurt people hurt people on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> it's like hurt people yes. hurt people, varsity hurt people hurt people, <laughs> AP class. Um, but it's like, but when we think about wrongdoing, we have to understand that while it is easier for us to put it in this bucket of like, oh, it's unfathomable that anyone would do that level of wrongdoing. It's unfathomable that John Smith would partake in being an administrator at a conversion therapy church clinic. What would you call it? Well, we call it a ministry. A ministry. Because we had to, you know, we had to make it religious. Get that nonprofit. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, so, it's it's easy to be like, well, it's so unfathomable that anyone would do that. And then, John, when you hear a little bit more about your story, you actually understand that, oh, this person was led to do this because they thought it was the right thing. And then hurt people hurt. I, I mean, how does how does that phrase, I, I don't want to be the only one monologuing on this, but like, how does the phrase hurt people hurt people sit with each of you as it relates to this story here? Well, I think for me, I didn't realize I was so hurt. I, I just didn't realize that I was young and I hadn't really processed my life and I, I wouldn't have known that. But as I've unraveled my life, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I I was a severely wounded person. Stay right there. We will be right back. And we're back. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I I was a severely wounded person. I wasted almost 30 years of my life trying to fix myself. I mean, I didn't do a 30-day program or, or a 10-day or a three-month or whatever. I did 30 years of Christian fundamentalism. I spent tens of thousands of dollars of my own money to, to get invested in this whole scenario I mean, I, I was in it. Um, it's too bad. I wasted all of that time, all those resources, and numerous relationships to the detriment of my relationship with my daughters, because I moved away thinking I could never be a good dad if I'm gay. So I've got to get this fixed. If I'm going to be a good dad, if I'm going to be successful as a dad, I can't do it being gay. So I have to do this. All of that cost me over 20 years of living around and with my own daughters and grandchildren. And and yes, I hurt people, hundreds, hundreds of people, thousands of people by my story. And to the most intimate of people, I wounded two wives, two children by my craziness and by my lack of knowing. And so it's it's just a constant thing that's in front of me every day that I'm evaluating, hoping hoping that I will get better at living this life and stop doing the crazy things that I've done. You know, it, it going through this whole thing of boy raced and, and all of these experiences, it's just this constant mirror in front of me of my life. Mm. It's this constant reflection that is not, it's, it's not fun. You know, it's not a good thing to see the the most regretful years of my life in many ways constantly put in front of me but it's also a mirror that helps me to see myself and so i choose to see it as a schoolroom of of learning and growing and and um aaron furian did a uh, a podcast with me a while back and it was um based on people admitting that they were wrong and it was a very good evaluation it was a wonderful way for me to kind of think through cuz i think while i speak um, to think through my life. And, and, uh, as, as she was going through that, she said, how do you know that you're right now? 
how do you know that you won't change again? Because I have reinvented myself numerous times <laughs> trying to find the best way, you know? And I said, probably the best answer to that to me now is that I hope that I'm working out of the motivation of love, which has never been the motivation before. Hmm. I said, that's the only answer I can have, but that doesn't mean I won't change. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I'm always asking the question, how can things be better? Yeah, because it's like, there's no way to know, right? Like we're on this crazy rock that's rotating and it's <laughs> very confusing. Right. So you hope that at least one ingredient could possibly point the way forward and that would be love. Mm. Yes. Right. Like real love, not love based out of fear or love as a concept. Right. But love that is deeply felt. And there's no way for anyone outside of that to know whether or not you're experiencing that. No, mm -hmm. there isn't. Right. You're That's right. the hardest part of it. But it's it's frustrating because there's no way aside from your actions, I think, to really prove it. And as someone who's been in the same world with John, not for as long, mm -hmm. not as deeply. I can see that he's doing the real work, you know, and there were times when I didn't always think that about you, John, you know, like I don't have access to your mind, but I have over time and very cautiously watched him. And what I can see is like a very different trajectory than a lot of other former members of conversion therapy that are very high profile. And it's it's frustrating because you want them to do the work too. And it honestly makes you look worse, John, whenever somebody else is not doing that work because you're like, oh, you know, you're being boxed with all these other people who are still working through their bullshit. Yeah, whereas John <laughs> has gone through more of an evolution. Yeah, like yeah, he's actually done the work and he's actually reached out to me and made me feel validated. Yeah. And I think, you know, it took me a while to see that. You know, John was getting a lot of attention at the very beginning because obviously it's a dramatic story. <laughs> you know, it's a very, it's a crazy story. But now, now that things are leveled, I feel, where both of us are seen as victims of a larger movement, or at least that's where the conversation is going. It feels like he's one of the rare ones that has done that work. And I don't think many people do this work, honestly. Like, especially when you're on the, like people are constantly praising you. That was wonderful for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, I've lost who I am yeah. because I believe yeah. what everyone's saying about me. Yeah. And I'm not actually inwardly focused mm -hmm. and doing real work yeah. to make sure that I am a good person. Okay. <laughs> and and I think like that there's, yeah, there's just the work is rarely recognized. It's rarely rewarded. Well, because it's, it's not visible. No, it's not visible. Yeah. And and. It's an intangible that is felt in a room. Yeah. Right? Like you can tell yeah. when someone is bullshitting, but they will still get that CNN interview. Oh, yeah. They will still get that whatever, and there will be a talking head who gets paid more than you do yeah. because, right. you know, right. they're snappy with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> snappy with it. You know, my motive is not to be in the limelight. Um, I like living on our little acreage in the country with my husband and and my cars and my woodworking stuff. And that's really where I want to be. Mm. But I'm willing out of responsibility that I feel I'm willing to do the interviews. I'm willing for my story to be told. I mean, you know, that's, that's the same way I feel actually. Cause I, at first, yeah, I was very excited that my book was getting more attention than it had, mm -hmm. but you quickly realize like it's a trap mm -hmm. because it is a hall of mirrors and to be constantly focused and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm seen as like this victim of this, this horrible thing. And I don't like being seen as a victim and I don't like the narratives that I get pushed into. So I can totally understand that. It's like every interview I do, I do it out of a sense of responsibility. Now I don't at all want it. <laughs> it's like, I got it. I got it. I'm done. <laughs> Let's be known for something else. And I don't seek it out. I'm, yeah, I'm not but, asking for it. Well, you're very different than some. But it is important, and, and I'm still committed to it. You know, I, I want to be used to help. And, and one of the things that, that's frustrating for me with this whole kind of movement we're sitting in is there are numerous survivors that really want to remove me and, and people that have come from my experience. They want us out of the picture, and yet 
I look at them and I'm going, but I'm one of your best advocates. It's true. You know, my story and my experience is speaking from inside the thing that wounded you. Mm-hmm. And and I have a way of, of, of communicating that to let people know what really went on and what the motives really were and what we really taught and why we taught it, what was behind it all to hopefully debunk this whole thing. And your story is valuable from one who's been there, but, but I have a, I have a valid experience that can help you. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but the, the pain and, and the recovery process is very challenging and difficult for the survivor. And, and I understand how they see me as the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. I get that, but I am a perpetrator that has said I was wrong. And, and like you said, I mean, I spent 10 years hopefully showing that consistently. Yeah. You know, I want to be, because I really do care about you. I care about you, Garrett, and I care about all the other 475 people that went through Love and Action. Mm -hmm. You know, I care about them. I really do. And many of them I'm in contact with on a regular basis. And I hear the stories like you've talked about. I hear the pain and the experiences and and I want to be an advocate for them and for the community. I mean, I I want to be that, but I don't want to make that my career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like if you're detonating a bomb, you want the person helping you to be someone who helped put the bomb together rather than someone who, right. you know, you, you need them on your side. I think that's a great analogy. If they're like, yes. I want to help detonate this with you, then you're going to want them, even though you're going to be in very valid ways wanting to not include them in that process. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that as someone who has both shared my story ad nauseum and felt very validated because of that. I can do this kind of work where I talk with John and it's no longer traumatic for me to have this conversation. It's like now, like I said, even before this interview, I'm like, oh, it's just John and not nervous, right? If it were a different therapist, I don't usually love doing that because they don't know, they're not always on the same Different level. therapist, meaning a therapist. Yeah, a uh, conversion therapist. Conversion like therapist. Former conversion therapist. Yeah. They're not always at that same level. Right. And th- I mean, the other thing is, like, I just think that we have to be cognizant of who speaks with whom mm-hmm. and when, right? Like, I feel like there's, like, graduation levels in activism, <laughs> right? Like, I'm now at the point where I can talk with, like, the worst mm-hmm. current and this is the opposite end of where John is, right? Like I can talk to the worst mm-hmm. currently involved conversion therapist and still be fine. Yeah. Like I might be right. having a bad afternoon after it, but I'm going to survive. And and you, <laughs> right, right, right. But you wouldn't have yeah. been in that place. No, I wouldn't have been in that place even two or three years ago. So I have a bigger question for you both, which is, you know, just as we were talking about hurt people, hurt people before, John, you were talking about all the people that you've hurt because of this. But then we also have to acknowledge that, John, you did not invent homophobia. (laughs) You did not invent the society that we live in that makes us want to not be gay anymore. Yeah. So my curiosity is what are the limits of that? Right. Where, where do we stop? Because then this also brings into the conversation the idea of accountability. And it's like, John, and I think you'd agree with this, you have to be accountable for what happened at Love and Action. But then we also have to keep on that balance beam of knowing that if we take out all our aggression of all of homophobia and all of conversion therapy on just one person, John Smid, that that is an inaccurate sense of like what caused this whole thing. Oh, yes, because I, you know, it's definitely, it's systemic. Yeah. I was just a piece of, of the system. Totally. Um, the, the whole issue is, is systemic in, in religious experience and religious culture. Mm-hmm. But when the system hurts us so much, when the macro hurts us so much, all we can do is take out our aggression on the micro. All we can do is take out our aggression on a person who upheld the system, a person who was part of the system. And while I know that that's like psychologically gratifying for a lot of victims, a lot of survivors, um, and anyone in the spectrum between the two, it's also incomplete. Yeah. So forgiveness without accountability is something I think of a lot, but just to isolate it just for this moment, forgiveness is kind of a theme that has to happen here, right? On the one hand, you know, it's like Garrett forgiving you, John, but on the other hand, it's also John, you forgiving yourself, which is a big thing. So to kind of take those two questions separately, 
Garrett, what is your relationship to forgiveness mm. when it comes to this story? It's changed over the years. You know, like I had to start with the people that were closest to me. So that was my parents. And I think I had to sort of intellectualize it to get through it. Because, forg- you know, genuine forgiveness is really hard work. And it's like a mountain totally. climbing experience. And it takes a ton of time. And it's just exhausting. And sometimes you're like, it's not worth it. I want to do other things. But as a writer, I was able to intellectualize it and say, you know, my book's not going to be good unless I figure out what the bigger issues are here and the cycles are and paint three-dimensional characters, not two-dimensional characters. So that was like my first step. But um, I don't. I think I pretended that I forgave John and I forgave people that were associated with love and action before I actually did because it was a good story. And it was... It was a story I wanted desperately to believe, but I've been doing a lot more work since the movie sort of upended my life. So I had to actually just go totally inward, disconnect, and say to myself, what do I actually feel here? And when I really put myself in John's mindset to actually go, okay, what's holding me back from understanding his experience? Yeah, It took a long time, and it's still unfolding. And a lot of it comes from the fact that John is saying all the right things and doing all the right things, you know? And I don't know if I could do that if he wasn't. And then on a larger scale, I've come to believe just recently that forgiveness is a gift for yourself. I mean, I, that's a cliche, but it's so true. And I've felt it now. And I think it's actually one of the most important things to do in my life. Because we're going to offend each other just by existing. We're going to do the wrong things all the time. And what we choose to do with that offense is incredibly important. Yeah. And it it's empowering. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the thing that I couldn't stand. Um, you know, we're in Brooklyn right now, but the thing that I couldn't stand is all of these, the, the Brooklyn queer community that's defining culture, mm-hmm. constantly telling me that my sort of including John or my, my choice to forgive mm-hmm. my parents was either a cynical move mm-hmm. or like weak or just wasn't politically viable. I'm just tired of all of that. I don't care. Like, I don't care what you want to decide about my life from the outside. This is my one life, right? Like, I've been given a lot of shit, and so has John, and so have my parents. And what we choose to do with each other is our business. And 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 that, I think, is a very powerful place to be, to go... I'm not going to listen to whatever the fad is right now. This is a bigger story. This is life and death. This is one life, right? Like, am I really just going to on my deathbed be like, you know what? I still hate John Smith. (laughs) It's so pointless. It's like, it's just, it's a pointless thing to do for me. No, and I I mean, forgiveness is only ever up to the person who does the forgiving yeah and by the same token to flip it around i think sometimes people get offended by seeing other people forgive people because they misunderstand it as a mandate and to be fair i think some people some onlookers to this conversation who aren't you garrett and who aren't you john are like you know uh, see, look at that. Let's just forgive the people yeah, who hurt true. us. And it's like, forgi- it for that. totally. And yeah. forgiveness cannot be a mandate. So just because you individually are choosing to forgive someone, choosing to forgive yeah. the people in your life doesn't mean other people have to do it. And and I think to recognize that, you know, people are, are all on a different journey. And that also includes the people who have the power to do the forgiving in the first place. And so some sometimes people use forgiveness or the acceptance of an apology in bad faith to mm-hmm. to kind of get other people off who who maybe don't yet deserve that yeah. <laughs> forgiveness it is not yeah and not don't enough deserve time that. has passed they haven't done enough work and well let me just ask the question plainly do you forgive john yeah yeah i don't have any anything i'm holding on to yeah. anymore <laughs> and that's and that's great but again that only speaks for you yeah and then john i guess the necessary follow up question here do you forgive yourself? I think for me, the term forgiveness is a 
is a trigger because for so many years there was the command to forgive. And yet we always tried to find a way to teach around that command because we knew Uh that you couldn't command forgiveness. Uh And so we tried to find ways in the Christian culture, we tried to find ways to somehow get people to forgive when we didn't really even know what that meant to forgive. It's hard to even define what does it mean to forgive. And so for myself, to forgive myself, the, the, the work that I've done to evaluate the why and the wherefore of all those years has helped me to see that it is what it is. Mm. If somebody brings it up, all I can do is acknowledge it. And one of the, one of the lessons that a former Love in Action client taught me many years ago that was deeply wounded by his experience uh, with love and action. And so this was a guy that I knew there were ill feelings between us and I wasn't satisfied with that. I, I really wanted there to be a resolution of peace between us. And so at one point I, I wrote him and I said, okay, these are the things that have come to my mind and I want to apologize for them. And I made a whole list of things that I, tangible, practical, literal things that had occurred that I knew about. So I said, you know, will you forgive me for this? And and he wrote back and he said, I cannot receive your letter the way it was written. Hmm. I've taken the liberty to rewrite it <laughs> and I'm sending it back to you. That's such a good move. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I read through what he had written and he didn't change any of the details. He changed the frame hmm. and he changed the frame from forgive me to I acknowledge that I did these things. Hmm. And he explained, he said, victims are almost always triggered by somebody saying, will you forgive me? Because it sounds like to them, you want to package it all up and act like it never happened. Yeah. And he said, if you just say, I acknowledge, it leaves the response from the victim to an open one. They can respond however they want to. And so I need to do that with myself. I acknowledge I did these things. Yeah. I did it. And I just have to let it let it lie there until something in me realizes that it's okay to let it go and let it be what it is. Um, and so with you know with a lot of this, you know, I just got a, a message today. You're going to hell. You're you're going to burn in hell. You know, I still get them. And and in the last three days, I've had extensive dialogue with a with a, a parent of a former love and action client that you know is still working through things. You know, we're still, you know, we're dialoguing and we're listening to one another and, and I'm hearing her as a mom and, and I know their story personally, you know, I have followed it for, oh my goodness, you know, almost probably almost 20 years. And so it's, it's a present situation of learning how to just listen. And if people are struggling with their emotional response, or I'm struggling with my emotional response, I just have to allow it to be there and not try to fix it. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's acknowledgement and, and not asking for, for, you know, will you forgive me, I think is an important correction. Right. I also love the idea of workshopping yeah. <laughs> yes. a letter that you receive. Yeah, <laughs> I love like, that. I've made a few corrections. This is an acceptable in its current yeah, form. I'm your editor. Yeah. If you would like to yeah. publish with me, yeah, 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 yeah. you need to change Which is, this. you know, the yeah. only person you can publish an apology <laughs> with. Um. So, you know, I, I think we can all agree. I think this is like a really beautiful conversation and a really heartwarming one, to be honest. But I think there's also then the bigger question of what next, because we also still have to like pull back and realize that conversion therapy is this incredibly horrible thing that is still happening just because, you know, this person, John Smid has realized the errors of his former ways and is now doing everything he can to change that. And Garrett, you're an activist for it too now. What next? You know, what what do we what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? I mean, I, there are so many organizations doing such great work. Like the Trevor Project, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, which is also connected in some ways with Born Perfect. So yeah, I mean, all of that grassroots work that's being done in each state, which is incredibly effective because we are actually one of the fastest moving LGBTQ rights movements in the history of LGBTQ rights because so many states have been 
passing uh, protections for LGBTQ people against conversion therapy. But there are many more to go. And I can't help but see this as part of a much bigger battle in the way that LGBTQ rights have been pushed back in terms of trans rights recently. You know, people are under attack. Like, it's it's all tied together. And so I think the same way that John and I are able to now see the fundamentalist roots of where we were at Love in Action, I think that we have to recognize the bigoted policies that are being consistently propagated by many states and and many politicians. So yeah, grassroots work is super important. Contact your local politicians. If you do not live in a state that has a ban, bother them over and over again. Because like the game plan is like to pass a protection against conversion therapy in every state for minors. And then once we do that, we say, hey, guess what? Every single state has determined that this is harmful for minors. Therefore, now we're moving on to saying we should protect for adults. But you have to do it in steps because if we do it too quickly or too soon, what we've, what we've seen is the courts are completely stacked against us. So <laughs> if this goes to the Supreme Court, there's no telling what they'll decide. John, wh- what about you? What, what do you think the way forward is from here? I think as I've looked at the legislative attempts, what I've seen them to be is is making a statement, which is important. I think that that's part of the way our culture works is to make those statements clear. But seeing the foundation of it being primarily fundamentalist Christianity, mm-hmm. that to me is the root of it. And that's where the support's coming from. And that's where it's happening. Yeah. It's happening in the counseling centers of Christian churches because they don't submit themselves Mm -mm. to any legal authority. Mm -hmm. For example, I I went for counseling from a counselor at a local Christian church in Memphis where I was, and this man used to be one of my staff members at Love in Action. And I went to him for counseling because I thought, oh, he's a Christian counselor, and he's, you know, I, I know him. And I went to him, and it wasn't until about three years ago I realized that his willingness to counsel me crossed over huge numbers of ethical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And when I was in there, we were getting to some emotional places. And I told him, I says, I'm really feeling vulnerable right now because I don't want to cry and boo-hoo and make a scene because I know that right outside this door are people that I know. Mm -hmm. And I'll feel embarrassed. And he said, oh, well, if you're unwilling to allow yourself to be vulnerable, then there's nothing I can do to help you. Oh, Yikes. And I just want to blast him now. I mean, (laughs) that's one place I haven't necessarily forgiven. I just want to say, you realize all kinds of ethical boundaries that you you crossed over here. And that's why our counseling relationship was not effective. But you don't, you're not living under those rules. And yet you were trained in professional education that tells you on the front end, never to do dual relationships. I mean, that is the most unhealthy and harmful and, and detrimental way to do counseling. And churches are doing it every single day. Yeah, and it's where most of it's actually taking place. And not only that, but a lot of churches are exporting conversion therapy to other countries. Yeah. Right. And, and they're not willing to look at 45 years history. They're not willing to look at the, the result of the experiment the United States has gone through and recognized was a, a, a failure. So in terms of what to do, you know, I'm in a quandary, you know, it's like, I don't know how to battle that. And so I think the only way we can battle it is not the only way. One of the only ways is just living our lives vulnerably and openly, telling our stories And hopefully, little by little, the people that are in those churches will begin to speak against it and to act against it. So I guess on one side, it's the legislative movements are wonderful and good and solid and and important to the whole movement. On the other side, the grassroots, next door neighbors kind of thing is also where it happens. And over time, I think that will change the culture to where it just won't accept this anymore. 
Now, at this point in the conversation, John brings up an example in order to illustrate the harm that is still being caused in some pastor's offices. But I'm jumping in here to anonymize the person that he's talking about because he shares a few personal details about her. And the only background you need to know is that she is a gay woman who was attending a church. Well, one day she went into the pastor's office and he he very quickly told her that he needed to perform an exorcism, that he needed to pray away the, the gay demons from her life. Now, this has only been a year or two ago that this happened. And so that's what I'm saying about in the offices of every, you know, all these pastor's offices where this stuff goes on. And I thought about Boy Erased and I thought, yes, it's a present reality. They want to grab her and take her into a room and start laying hands on her and, you know, scaring the demons out of her. Mm -hmm. What do you feel you can do about that? Do you ever feel like a responsibility to take that pastor aside and be like, here's what happens when you do that? <laughs> Well, being a peacemaker, I have a hard time challenging to that level. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay. I think you have to know what your level is. I think there are some people who work really well on the micro and being really kind to their neighbors one-on-one -on -one and wanting to be accepted by a community and then successfully being accepted by that community and then changing that community slowly over time. And then I think there are some people who are more well-suited to active resistance and that's how they bring about change. And, and I think we can all agree that there's not not this one size fits all thing no. because th there are people who very justifiably just want to fully flee from the communities that they're part of because they're too toxic for them. And that too is okay if they're choosing to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not living in Arkansas right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. You know? right. <laughs> um, just to kind of close it off, how has this conversation felt for you guys? For me, it's been really easy. Okay, great. Actually. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's just just a conversation, you know, and uh, I was somewhat anxious, mostly because I didn't know really where it was going to go or what questions were going to be asked or those kinds of things. But I mean, that just went away immediately. And mm. and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good conversation. I think I think it's really healthy and and, and good and healing and and uh, a, a definitely a step forward. And I am interested to hear how this discussion is received mm -hmm. and what it sparks in people. Yeah. I mean, for me, it did as much as it's a cliche, you know, and as much as you like want to set yourself up for something to feel healing, mm -hmm. it did actually, there was that moment when John was describing his therapy experience where I was like, Oh fuck, this is actually real. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like I have to actually feel something right now. <laughs> um, and then when he was talking about like wasting all that time, that those were the two moments that were very healing for me because I felt both of those things not to not to the degree with which John felt thirty years of his life yeah. and like you know his family that he harmed, but I did feel like you know I went to Ukraine for three years in the Peace Corps. I like traveled around the world. I was I spent six years of my formative life in Europe, yeah. Eastern Europe, because it's just like, I don't want to, yeah. I can't even be here anymore. I don't know what I want right. out of my life. And a lot of that time felt very wasted. You know, it felt like I was spinning mm. circles in my brain and it felt, you know, like I could have written already four books, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, and not right, right. this book, yeah. which I didn't want to write, mm -hmm. you know, like any book, but this one mm -hmm. is really what I would have loved to have written. Um, and so it just, yeah, I really connected with that. And I thought how strange for that not to be a concept, but to be something I felt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say, honestly, thank you both so much for doing this. I think this has been truly fascinating for me. And I also think that this has the ability to help people. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for doing this. I'm going to stop the recording on the computer, but the call is staying on. Okay. okay. And we'll all talk soon, okay? Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. All right, bye. I know that this trilogy of episodes was a little atypical for this podcast, as this show typically focuses on digital conflict. Mean comments, rude DMs, subtweets, social media callouts, and the general way that, you know, we express negativity to and at each other in the digital age. 
But I wanted to include these episodes as part of the Conversations with People Who Hate Me project because of what they say about forgiveness. As you heard me say, forgiveness can't be a mandate. We can't demand that people forgive those who have hurt them because, as you also just heard, forgiveness is a process. It's slow. It's messy. It's complicated. And it is incredibly personal. True forgiveness, I believe, can only ever be granted by the person who has been hurt, and not by the bystanders who loudly express their opinion about whether or not forgiveness is deserved. Which means that I can't tell you who to forgive, and nor can this show. Still, I worry about our capacity to forgive in this digital age when we have so many tools at our disposal to call people out and fewer to call people in. I worry that social media rewards us way more for hating someone than humanizing them. And I worry about this because I believe that when we humanize each other, even those who have hurt us, we discover that our conflict is not a battle to be won, but a project that we can work on together. Thank you so much for listening to this season of Conversations with People Who Hate Me. If you like this show, tell people about it. Rate it, review it, all of those good things. And to be the first to hear about what's next, hit subscribe or sign up for my newsletter in the link of the description of this episode. I also invite you to check out Conversations with People Who Hate Me, the book, if you want to consume a digestible version of all that I've learned about communication from making this show. And if you want to gift it to someone, just know that I wrote it to be enjoyed by the most avid listeners and people who have never even heard of this project before. If you have an idea for a conversation for this show, head on over to www.conversationswithpeoplewhohateme.com where you can fill out a brief submission form. Conversations with People Who Hate Me is part of the TED Audio Collective. This episode was mixed by Vincent Cascione. The theme song is These Dark Times by Caged Animals. The logo was designed by Philip Black Owl with a photo by Mindy Tucker. And this show was made by me, Dylan Marin. We'll be back soon. And until next time, please remember, there is a human on the other side of the screen. Ooh, we're racing, racing through these dark times. And it's hard to take it. We're going to make it through these dark times. Make it through these dark times. Dark times